percent of Canadian exports flow to the United States. Uh, and as you underlined, what, what less people know is that Canada is the United States' biggest export market. Uh, 17%, or as you said, almost 20% of U.S. goods uh, head north to, the, to Canada. If you look at foreign direct investment, there is a similar two-way dynamic. Uh, in 2022, more than half of Canadian FDI went to the United States by 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 large uh, by far largest share of our FDI that was uh, roughly forty three billion dollars uh, in the same year fifty billion dollars uh, of U.S. FDI came to Canada so it, it's a pretty balanced relationship and I think what these these numbers un underline is just how close that economic relationship is and how it works in both directions and the final thing I'll say is when you look forward we face many of the same structural challenges. Our labor forces are aging. Uh, there's going to be a big challenge with new technology, training, uh, and making sure we have the skill, skilled workers our economies needs. Uh, climate change is affecting both of our, both our economies. We're both grappling with shifting trade and investment patterns globally. Uh, supply chains uh, across both our countries need to build more resilience, conflicts, internationally are increasing global uncertainty. And for all these reasons, uh, I am very glad we're having this discussion. We do have much in common. And Randy, as you underlined, when we work together, we can get a lot more done. Thank you. Well, thanks. That's a great place to start. Chairman Powell, really interested in hearing your perspective. Another place to start is to say, why don't you call me Jay and call <laughs> Tiff? Okay, I know I do it behind the scenes. I'll do it in front okay. of the scenes too. Great. Um, so let me start by uh, thanking Randy and Bill and Xavi and Tiff for this. It's great to be here today. Um, I want to echo what Randy said about the mutually beneficial, respectful, great relationship we have with Canada, economically, culturally, uh, and uh, I'd also like to echo, uh, I thought Tiff did a great job talking about the similarities and differences uh, in our economy, our financial markets, the challenges we face in our policy stance. It's almost as though you somehow had a copy of that part of my remarks, Tiff. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not gonna repeat that, but what I will do is talk, if I could, a little bit about the, um, the US economy and, and where we find ourselves right now. So as, as uh, I think Randy pointed out the performance of the U.S. economy over the past year has really been quite strong. Um, we had growth of more than 3% uh, last year as rebounding supply supported both robust growth and in spending and also uh, employment alongside a considerable decline in inflation. The more recent data show solid growth and continued strength in the labor market, but also a lack of further progress so far this year on returning to our 2% inflation goal. So I'll say a little bit about uh, our two mandate goals, maximum employment and price stability. Uh, as I mentioned, the labor market remains very strong. Payroll job gains have been strong over the first quarter, averaging just a tick above 275,000 per month. The unemployment rate has been below 4% for 26 consecutive months, which hasn't happened uh, in more than a half a century, uh, the longest streak of its kind. Strong man demand for workers has been met by a substantial increase in the workforce due both to rising labor force participation and a substantial increase in immigration as indeed Canada has experienced as well. So even, by with, even with this strength, uh, by many measures, our labor market has been moving into better balance over the past year. Uh, the ratio of job openings to unemployed workers was extremely elevated in 2021 and 22 has now moved back down to levels just above the pre-pandemic era. Surveys of workers and businesses indicate a normalizing labor market. So do the rates of both quits and hires uh, and uh, broader wage pressures also continue to moderate, albeit gradually. So the overall picture for the labor market is one of real strength, but gradual normalization. Turning to price stability, uh, our inflation mandate. Inflation, of course, declined quite significantly over the second half of last year, over the whole year, but particularly in the second half. But 12-month core PCE inflation, which is uh, one of the most important things we, we look at, is estimated to have been little changed in March over February at 2.8%, and the three- and six-month measures of inflation are actually above that level. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%, before it would be appropriate to ease policy. 
you know, we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings that we had in the second half of last year. Uh, the recent data uh, have clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. That said, we think policy is well positioned to handle the risks that we face. If, if higher inflation does persist, we can maintain the current level of restriction for as long as needed. At the same time, we have significant space to ease should the labor market unexpectedly weaken. Right now, given the strength of the labor market and progress on inflation so far, it's appropriate to allow restrictive policy further time to work and let the data and the evolving outlook guide us. Come what may, we remain strongly committed to returning inflation over time sustainably to 2%. Well, thank you. I think that's a, a really important frame for our discussion today. Um, one of the things that I remarked on when I first got into public life was how often I saw my international peers uh, as I as we moved around. And when I see the two of you on stage together, I know that often you uh, see each other at G7, at G20 meetings. And I think it would be quite interesting for the audience to understand, you know, how collaboration happens or doesn't happen internationally, mm -hmm. how central banks work together uh, or don't work together. So, uh, you know, maybe I could ask you, Jay, to give a perspective on on how that uh, how that happens from from uh, from your vantage point. Sure. So um, to, to give you an idea, we do meet quite regularly. So uh, Tiff and I attend uh, two G7 min uh, meetings per year for ministers, that's finance ministers and central bank governors. We don't attend the leaders meeting, but we attend I, in the United States, but we attend the meetings with the finance ministers, which, which Bill was, and also two G20 meetings. So that's two, that's four meetings per year right there. We also have six meetings, uh, at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. One of those is now virtual, but we're in, and, and that's only central bankers, no finance ministries. So it's all central banking uh, stuff. And you know, it's, it's economics, it's financial regulation, all those things. We also come here to Washington or every third year we go someplace else twice a year for the IMF World Bank meetings, which is kind of what everybody's doing in Washington right now. So it's a lot of meetings. What do we do at these meetings? Um, <laughs> fair question. <laughs> Essentially, uh, we, the central bankers, are, are having an ongoing conversation about what's going on in their own economies and their own financial markets, their own regulatory world with each other. And we're also talking about the big global issues of the day, as you would expect. So uh, some of which are really the business of the elected government, not the business of the central bankers. But we, you know, we, we have that discussion. It's more or less ongoing. We're seeing each other all the time. Uh, they're very informative, these discussions, and they, they, they really are, for me anyway, part of the way that, that I get to thinking about what the right policy is for the United States, is to hear uh, what is going on around the world, what, what, what's happening globally, and how are people thinking about that. So it's, it's very, very uh, useful, particularly, though, given our close cultural, financial, and economic ties with Canada, those discussions are especially fruitful and important. And, you know, I have regular conversations with Tiff. By the way, I do keep very close track of, of the actions of the Bank of Canada. I read Tiff's press conference transcripts carefully and uh, pay, pay close attention to that. Uh, Tiff did uh, mention the similarities and differences. Um, I'll say one more thing, which is we, we go to Basel, as I mentioned, five times a year. You're a long way from home, and there usually is, we're there for four or five nights, and they're usually one or two nights off. So we go looking for someone to have dinner with, and very frequently we wind up with the Bank of Canada delegation for, <laughs> who are really good and very funny and a, and a lot of fun together. So we have a very close relationship with the bank and great respect for that institution, as I'll, I'll have a little more to say about lately. One, one other thing I'll point out, though, uh, about our relationship is we did do, as Randy pointed out, our first monetary policy, first review of our monetary policy framework really ever. And we looked around, the Bank of Canada also does regularly, I think it's every four years. In any case, uh, we, we really looked to the Canadian model and other models of how to do that. We talked to people at the Bank of Canada about how their regular framework review went. So we, we really benefited for that. Um, so that's what I'll stop there. <clears throat> and Tiff, similar perspective from Canada? I, I, yes, I mean, I'll just add a little bit on, on uh, you know, as Jay outlined, uh, certainly from my perspective, one of the best parts about this job is uh, we do, you know, the, inter the international community, the central banking community 
it, it's not like a commercial bank where you're competing against your the other bank. We're all in this together. And if we get it right, it we all help each other. Uh, so th there is there is a considerable openness. And you know, as Jay outlined, I think there, there's a few there's a few different functions. Yes, we obviously if you're in Canada, you know, we have our own group at the Bank of Canada that that analyzes the U.S. economy, forecasts the U.S. economy. It's very important to Canada, but uh, you know, the Fed's group is a lot bigger. They got a lot more experience. Uh, hearing what the Fed has to say is incredibly valuable for us. The other thing we do, though, is it's it's more than just the data and the forecasting. It's it's thinking through the scenarios together. You know, what risks are on your mind, Jay? Uh, what do you think could go wrong? What are the scenarios? How you know how would we handle it if if this happened? If that happened? Being able to put your heads together and think through the risks, the scenarios, the strategy. Um, there are also a number of really, I would say, sort of behind the scenes very central banky technical issues that you know nobody really thinks about except central bankers but you know what are the mechanics of QE how do you exit from QT how many settlement balances are we going to need to uh, you know fortunately those are things most people don't have to worry about they are critically important for the implementation of of monetary policy uh, and that sort of plumbing working of the financial system and you know being able to talk to people who are thinking about these things as much as you are is hugely valuable and then the last thing I will say is, you know, there's some things um, that we're only going to succeed if we do together. The obvious one would be financial supervision and regulation. You know, our, our financial systems globally are highly integrated. We were uh, deeply reminded of this in the global financial crisis. Uh, what happens in other countries affects all of us. Um, and money flows, money flows across borders. So, you know, we, we have to do that together uh, or it's not going to work. Well, maybe we can drill into that for a minute. Uh, you know, obviously we recognize that most of your work is focused on the domestic markets, but uh, in times of crisis, there's real challenge. As you mentioned in the COVID period, uh, the global financial crisis, uh, you know, that uh, you were engaged with TIFF earlier in a different stage of your career. And for me, it was remarkable, the number of, of interactions with counterparts around the world during those crises. So maybe a question to both of you is, you know, what, what kind of interaction happens during periods of crisis? Uh, what doesn't happen? It, are there things that we should be thinking about differently in order to prepare ourselves for those, for those challenging moments and making sure that the financial system is resilient? So again, maybe over to you, uh, Jay, to uh, react to that and, and uh, hear your thoughts. Sure. So, um, you know, our economies, our financial markets, all of our institutions are, are deeply intertwined. And when you when there is a, a situation where there's serious stress, you need to get a global perspective. You need to get perspective around the world, and you need you have to do that very quickly. And and we of course can move effect, quickly and effectively on the domestic front. But what the the thing that you you figure out in those times is that all the time you spent at Basel and at the G7 and G20 meetings, you know your colleagues, you you know and trust and respect their judgment, and you don't have to go through that that phase of gaining trust in people. You understand you understand each other. You speak the same language. So there's a lot of communication. The level of communication is pretty high anyway, but during crises, it goes it goes very high. You're constantly talking to I'm constantly talking to. Um, other central bankers around the world, and also political leaders uh, in, in our government and that sort of thing. So that, that happens a lot. Um, uh, the sense of what you're doing, again, is mostly sharing information and ideas about what to do. There may be a proposal that, that people are looking at and you're talking about that. So it's, it's, it's very useful. Um, I say uh, one thing to point out is it's less about coordination than it is about about talking and understanding it, it, for one reason, or at least it was during the pandemic. And that was because almost every country's interest rates were very close to zero when the pandemic hit. And so there wasn't space, there wasn't policy space for most economies, most central banks to do a big coordinated rate cut. We did cut very quickly to zero, but we were, I think we were higher than almost any other uh, uh, nation in terms of where our policy rate was. But um, Anyway, it, there's there's a lot of communication and and those those relationships that you built up really do uh, help at that point. Um, in terms of what we've you asked about learning, what have we learned? You know, I I think that the pandemic is going to teach a whole lot of lessons over time. I still think it's too early to say what they are with confidence. And and I'll point out, look at 
the, the pandemic has surprised us over and over again, most recently by in the United States, the remarkably strong performance of the economy at a time when virtually all economists were expecting a recession. So I think if you'd ask for the lessons of the pandemic a year and a half ago, you'd get a very different answer. Now, I think in, I think in a year or so, we'll have a lot more answers. It's just, it is a unique uh, set of circumstances and we're still learning, I think, but we, we will try to learn those lessons. Different point, I would say, about the bank stresses, another crisis, uh, at least here in the States. I do think we we can and have learned the lessons of the stress of, of early, early last spring. And um, I would point to a couple things that we embraced pretty forthrightly. One was that supervision was not tightly focused on the right things, was not proactive enough, was not forceful enough. And we've tried to take steps to to remedy that. I also think there will be some regulatory initiatives for banks of that size and with those characteristics uh, in time. So I, I do think those those are lessons that, that we that we have learned. And from a Canadian perspective, similar lessons or different ones? Yes, I think there are similar lessons. Maybe I'll just give a couple of other examples. I'll just, first though, I will just underline, you know, when, when a crisis hits, you're, you're, you're faced with a situation, you have to make decisions and you have very limited information. The other reality is you have a pretty narrow window to act to be really effective. And for both those reasons, you know, being able to speak, you know, directly to Jay, uh, to connect with our other colleagues, finding out what's happening in their jurisdiction, how are they thinking about it, what do they see as the options, it is hugely important in a crisis. Uh, and that it's a little more though than just information sharing. I mean, I think it helps us un avoid. Um, unintended consequences of our actions. Sometimes you do something and it works for most parties, but not one party. And in a crisis, you know, it's the weakest link that can take you down. So you, you, you've got to be careful. Uh, it also, I think, boosts confidence in the system. If we're acting in a you know in a way that is coherent together, it boosts confidence. It it you know it it looks more like a plan than than a haphazard policy response. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, um, you know, at the, I wasn't actually governor at the start of, of COVID. Jay was there, but certainly looking at it from the outside, the coordinated actions of, of major central banks to um, to reopen fixed income markets, uh, you know, providing liquidity, providing market making of last resort in scale, uh, you know, it, re, it restarted reopened core functioning markets. Uh, and by all doing it essentially at the same time and all working in scale, the whole global market restarted. If that had not happened, this crisis would have been a much deeper and more severe crisis. And then the, the other one I'll highlight is, is, uh, coping with the inflation as we came out of COVID, uh, you know, by you know by all uh, being resolute in our commitment to restoring price stability, by all matching our words with forceful action, raising rates rapidly, we did we we all helped each other. I mean, it it helped reduce global inflation in goods, which was really the first part of the the inflation surge, uh, and it helped keep inflation expectations in all our countries better anchored. And I think it, it is a key ingredient in how we have all managed to get inflation down uh, a long way back with, without causing recessions in our economies. And the last point I'll just highlight is something you said. Um, occasionally this, this uh, coordination is very explicit. So for example, at the time of the global financial crisis, there was a coordinated G7 interest rate cut. I remember clearly because it happened at three o'clock in the morning in Canada, uh, which was, was a little bit of a technical challenge. Um, you know, but most of the time it's not explicit coordination, but it is those conversations. It is that shared information. We have similar objectives, similar goals, similar tools, and we're sharing information, and that leads to a coordinated response. Well, maybe you could spend a little bit more time on that from the, the Canada-US perspective. So Randy mentioned in his opening comments uh, the idea that when you're in Canada, you're living next to an elephant. And uh, I think a lot of Canadians would assume that, uh, that Canadian policy has to take into account US policy. So. Maybe could you give us a perspective into how important that is for uh, for your deliberations, and uh, you know how that factors into decision making, the U.S. approach. Uh, well, look, 
I, I think it, it's pretty clear that the, our, our U.S. economic relationship is by far our most important relationship. Our economies are highly integrated. You know, 35% of our GDP is exports and 75% of that goes to the United States. So multiple, you know, that, that's a big chunk of our GDP. Um, our financial markets are also very integrated. In fact, yesterday I was in, in New York uh, and when you go to New York, you are just reminded how integrated our markets are. I, I was at the uh, New York Stock Exchange and, uh, you know, all over our, you know, cross-listed Canadian companies on, on, on many of the screens. Um, our, our financial systems are very integrated. Our banks have, uh, most of our large banks have uh, operations in the United States. Our pension funds are big investors uh, in the United States. Um, so we do spend a lot of time understanding what's going on, trying to understand what's going on in the United States and looking at the implications for Canada. There are though, you know, I, I highlighted in my opening remarks some differences. I, the, another important difference I didn't focus on is, you know, both our economies have big manufacturing sectors, big service sectors, uh, large commodity sectors, but the commodity sector in the Canadian economy is quite a bit bigger uh, than it is in the United States. Oil and gas, agriculture, forestry, mining, um, <clears throat> fishing, 40% uh, of our exports, 13% of our GDP. And the commodity cycle can be quite different. And um, we have a flexible exchange rate that does help absorb uh, the differences. Uh, and I think it's an important reason why historically, sometimes our monetary policy is a do, do differ. Our cycles are often quite similar and certainly through COVID, we had a similar shock and a pretty similar cycle and our monetary policy has been quite similar. There have been other episodes though, where particularly if the commodity cycle is different, you'll see monetary policy diverge somewhat from the United States. There are limits to how far it can diverge. But as I emphasized, um, we we have our own currency, we have a flexible exchange rate and that, that allows, that absorbs the differences to allow us to gear monetary policy to what we need to do in Canada. And Jay, from your perspective, obviously the U.S. has an outsized role in, in the global economy. And I guess we'd be interested in understanding how much time do you deliberate on what your actions will have uh, as reactions? And how much do you think about, you know, what's happening with global markets as you come to your conclusions? So I'll, just, I'll start by saying that each central bank serves a domestic mandate, which is in the case of Fed is using our tools to achieve maximum employment and price stability for the benefit of, of the people we serve. So it's a domestic mandate. But in the case of the United States, we fully realize and appreciate that our decisions can have significant effects on, not just on Canada, but on, or Mexico, but on countries around the world. Uh, and that's all the more so because the dollar is the reserve, the principal reserve currency, which strengthens the transmission of our policy through the global economy. So. We also know that, <clears throat> that those effects, that effects on global demand um, from, our, uh, you know, from our policy changes can have a, an effect on the United States as well, that can, can rebound to the United States. So we're very, very aware of, of all of that. And for one thing, we try, we try to be very transparent and predictable given the, flow, given the flow of data and events. I mean, you have to move quickly sometimes, but we do realize we have a special obligation to be predictable and transparent and that that benefits us in doing that as well. So international spillovers, of course, are an important consideration. We do track that. Uh, ultimately, though, we think over over time, the most important thing we we can do for to support the global economy is to deliver on our mandate of price stability and maximum employment here in the United States. And and is that you know have there been changes in this current cycle that uh, that have drived any differences? I mean, you've talked about the different drivers for inflation this go around from previous periods of inflation. So do you, do you think about it differently as you, as you approach these things? Yeah, I, well, specifically, specifically on inflation, I do think this is different. This is not simply the more standard case of overheated demand, which has been the typical thing in the post-war era for, for the U.S. economy and other major Western economies. Um, there are similarities and differences, and I, I would characterize it that this way that the, the the inflation that arose suddenly really in in the early part of 2021 as economies reopened resulted both from constrained supply and also elevated and rechanneled demand from services to goods 
Um, so if you remember, and you, I'm sure will, there were unexpected widespread shortages and supply sh chain failures on a scale not seen in, in recent memory. In the US, several million people had left the, la the labor force, creating a severe labor shortage that was more fully felt once the economy reopened, leading to a, a huge spike in, in wages, and, but also in uh, the ratio of job openings to unemployed workers. So very unusual situation. Households had elevated levels of savings and demand was very, very strong as well. So we thought it, this, what's different is we thought have thought since since we've understood the situation that restoring price stability would, would require both the unwinding of the pandemic related distortions to both supply and demand, as well as the effects of tight monetary policy on demand, which would give the supply side time and space to recover. And we think today that we're seeing those two things working together to, to bring that end about. Um, and you saw that, I think, in 2023, which was really, uh, in a large way, a supply side story. Uh, what happened was um, the supply side really recovered in 2023. We thought that it would recover in 2021. And in 2022, I was beginning to lose hope. And then in 2023, you saw the shortages and and the uh, issues with uh, with with the trade pipelines, not fully resolved, but largely resolved. You saw the lab U.S. labor force shortage alleviated by both higher participation among people who uh, had dropped out of the workforce, but also for, from immigration. So that was the year of the supply side recovery. And you saw the, the core inflation rates drop by two full percentage points in the face of very strong growth. So that can only be explained by the enormous increase in potential output the supply side increase over that year. Um, so that, that's how I would say it's different this time. And, and Tiff, maybe you can tell us how it's different in other ways in Canada. So we, you know, we're talking about the similarities and the similar approaches to dealing with inflation and the, you know, the positive results, but we've seen a divergence in Canada with respect to growth. So clearly there's some, some differences too. Maybe can you reflect for, for people what those what those differences look like and what the what the ramifications are for you yeah i will focus on the differences although i i will stress i would i think the, the main story is the similarities um and as jay outlined uh, what is so unique about this whole cycle is that supply has played a much bigger role than than we're used to um and from a monetary policy perspective we don't have as good line of sight to so supply as we do as demand, and we don't have any tools to influence supply. Our tools work on demand. Um, in terms of what, what has been different, uh, if, if you look at the Canadian economy, growth uh, was essentially zero in the second half of last year. And what that meant was the economy, which was very overheated, uh, supply caught up with demand. In fact, it more than caught up with demand. The economy moved into excess supply. And we're now seeing the effects of that in terms of relieving price pressure. So, you know, why did demand slow more in Canada, the United States? I think uh, that that is a difficult question. I, I pointed to a couple of things in my opening remarks. I think productivity growth in the United States has been a lot stronger. You've gotten more supply than we have. So you've been able to grow more with less inflation uh, or less inflationary pressure. Um, and then the second thing is I think monetary policy is having more traction in Canada because the, the structure of our mortgage markets, half of mortgages have renewed in Canada. Uh, and even if your mortgage hasn't renewed, it's renewing in the next couple of years, probably. So you're thinking ahead, thinking, oh, when it renews, I'm going to have to be paying a lot more uh, on my mortgage every month. So maybe I should be saving more money now. So we're seeing the, the, that effect. We've had weaker consumption growth. Um, and certainly that's been somewhat masked by the fact we've had very rapid population growth. But if you look on a per capita basis, you can see um, household spending per, per capita, per family has actually gone down even though growth uh, has not been negative overall. I think you know, moving forward, um, we are actually seeing growth starting to pick up. Uh, the first quarter of this year looks pretty strong. Um, we'll probably see some choppiness quarter to quarter, but overall we think that that strength we're seeing in the first quarter will be sustained through the year where we, we think on a quarterly basis, growth is gonna be averaging about 2% per quarter through this year. That's partly, we're. We expect to see, we're starting to see some uh, pickup in consumption. Um, 
partly it is the resilience of the U.S. economy that is supporting our our exports. They've been very resilient. Um, and then coming back to inflation, I think those, broadly speaking, the path of inflation has, is pretty similar. But you are seeing, um, I think, some of those differences in the uh, dynamics of the real economy in inflation. You know, our last few inflation readings have been reasonably good, um, even though totals still close to three. Uh, core has been, you know, the last few times ticking down. And if you look at the more timely three months measures of core inflation, there, there is some downward momentum in, uh, in underlying inflation. And I think that reflects the fact the economy is in excess supply and that is relieving those price pressures. We're certainly looking for uh, evidence that, that that's going to be sustained. That's what we're looking for right now. Well, I, I know that, uh, that both of you realize that one of the key things we were trying to emphasize today was the importance of the, the Canada-US relationship. And uh, I also really appreciate all of the comments on the importance of trade to, our, to both of our economies, trade between our, our two countries, and, and foreign direct investment. And so um, while you're not trade policy experts, and I get that your organizations, that's not the focus, I really appreciate you giving us a little sense of, you know, how do you think about uh, trade in, in, in economic terms and the importance of that and um, how that factors into your, your economic outlook. And specifically, we're, we're thinking about the importance of the, uh, the agreement between the United States, Canada and Mexico and wondering how you think about that in terms of its impacts on, on trade in general, on labor markets, on supply. Um, so maybe I could I could ask you, Jay, to give us any reflections that you might have on that and deliberations uh, impacts. So I guess I need to start by saying we don't do trade policy. We don't really comment on trade policy other than to say that uh, it's clear that we have a mutually beneficial, large, substantial, ongoing, healthy trade relationship with with Canada that we very much welcome. Maybe I'll add one more thing, which is I want to focus on a particular export of uh, of uh, Canada that I think somehow we, we just desperately need here in the United States and we can't get enough of it. And that is um, Canadian com comedians and comic actors. <laughs> I started to count uh, the number of really great, funny people. I, I, I limited myself to 10. So Jim Carrey, Martin Short, John Candy, Mike Myers, Norm MacDonald, Rick Moranis, Dan Aykroyd, Catherine O'Hara, and Andrea Martin. And I could go on. So something's going on up there. Americans love Canadian. If that's Canadian humor, we absolutely love it. So send, send more. We can't get enough of it. That's a small but important part of our trading relationship, I guess. <laughs> Tiff, all jokes aside, yeah. any, any comments from your perspective? Yeah, well, first of all, as, as Jay underlined, we don't set trade policy. But, but let me just say, um, try to give you more of a picture. I mean, first of all, you just look at our two countries. The east-west border is the longest border in the world, and it's a long way across Canada. So it often makes a lot more sense to trade north-south than to trade across the country. And that that's really you know, it comes down to geography in some sense. I mean, that's fundamental to the inner ties we have across our, our countries. Many Canadians are closer to fellow Americans than they are to fellow Canadians. Uh, just the, the nature of the geography. You look at what what are the things that we buy and sell? Well, um, you know, some of the biggest things uh, in Canada, we buy a lot of your consumer goods in the United States. Um, we have a very uh, two-way relationship on motor vehicles. Uh, you buy a lot of the motor vehicles we produce. We buy a lot of cars and trucks that you produce. Uh, similarly, energy. Um, we're both energy producers. Uh, it often makes more sense to trade the energy north-south than to ship it across the country. So we have a very dynamic two-way uh, energy relationship. And you look forward and you look at, you think about how much electricity the world's gonna need. Uh, I expect that relationship is only gonna grow. Another element that is growing quickly, and, and maybe that's partly comedians, is uh, the fastest part growing the fastest growing part of trade is, is trade and services. Now, if you want a haircut, you still have to do it in your own country, unless you want to go to New York to get a really fancy one. But, uh, um, you know, by, but, but increasingly, a lot of services are highly tradable. The internet has completely changed how many things are delivered. Uh, and so you're seeing uh, Canadians are increasingly uh, importing a lot of commercial services from the United States. And then the final thing I'll say is, um, 
on US MCA. Um, obviously for both countries, um, the market access is, is key. The other thing I would underline though, it's also the certainty about the market access. The certainty that American companies have that they'll have access to Canadian markets and Canadians will have access to American markets. That allows businesses to make investments, to you know, deploy their risk capital, to commit to the future. Uh, and it, it's, that, it's that certainty of access that is really key to building, you know, building investment. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to, uh, to thank both of you for taking some time with all of us. I think if we had looked back a, a couple of years ago and, and <clears throat> reflected on what we were thinking back then might be the trajectory of our economies, uh, we probably wouldn't have had an expectation that we would have been where we are today. We would have expected more challenges than we've, we've faced. And I think we need to recognize that the stewardship that uh, the Federal Reserve in the United States and the Bank of Canada in Canada have um, been responsible for has made an enormous difference in citizens' lives. I mean, we're in a situation that uh, is virtually our best case scenario. So it's uh, probably not often enough that on stage you're recognized for, for that important work. And I wanna thank both of you for all that you're doing for uh, all of us in making that the reality. And also I wanna thank you for taking some time here. I mean, we are, we are uh, reflecting on the fact that in a couple of years, the, um, the US-Mexico-Canadian trade agreement will be looked at again. And we want to reinforce the importance of working together, the importance of collaboration and cooperation, and really great trading relationships. So uh, this is a, a, an important way for us to start this off, seeing the collegiality between the two of you, knowing how uh, well people work together is, uh, is really important for people. So thank you very much. And uh, I know it's a busy week for you, so we appreciate also taking the time during this busy week. So thank you. From, from the uh, Canada Institute, I'm going to ask Xavi uh, Delgado to, uh, to close off our session today. Thank you, Bill. That concludes today's program, everybody. Thank you all, everybody in the room and online for joining us today. I also want to give a thanks to our various dean panelists and our co-chairs, as well as the Canada Institute Director, Christopher Sands, whose vision we are all lucky enough to execute on here. Folks, we're going to ask that you stay seated while the panelists depart the stage. But just one last time, this has been the launch of the Washington Forum on the Canadian Economy. Thank you all very much for joining us. One last round of applause for our panelists, please. <laughs>